the host of the Beepin Show, direct from the College of DuPage, welcome Chris Miller. I just noticed backstage my lapel is not sitting, sitting well, <clears throat> so whatever. <laughs> anyway, hey, welcome to uh, Fermilab, and th welcome to our second annual Physics Slam. Uh, you know, I got, look, I've been working, uh, watching the speakers for the past 10 days, and I teach speech communication, and I was at dinner tonight, and I kept saying, you know, my least favorite class in high school was physics. Um, and, and, I, and now I wish it hadn't been. Um, because when I watch them, I have, sometimes I have no idea what they're talking about, right? But then as I watch their speeches more and more, I thought, I, I understand, I get it. And that's why we're here tonight for the Physics Slam, is to learn about physics in a way that uh, we've never learned about physics before. So I'm, I'm just excited to be here to host your show. The other thing is I keep walking, I apologize for walking back and forth, but I, last year when I emceed this show, I was completely shocked by the amount of young people that were in the audience. And, uh, you know, I have two, I was telling people again at dinner that I have two young children. I have a son named Wyatt who's going to turn six on November uh, 19th, and I have a daughter. Hey, thank you. Hey, yeah. I, got, I have another one. I have another one. <laughs> I have a girl named Maggie, uh, Margaret, and even after my grandmother, I love you, my grand, um, who's 11 months old. And what's cool about it is that, yeah, okay, <laughs> applaud for them. <laughs> they better be sleeping. Um, but I thought it was cool because there's a lot of young people here tonight. And so what I did last year, and I'm going to do it again this evening, and that is, if you're under 18, quickly, okay, applaud your hands. Put your hands together and applaud. Okay, stop. Now... People that are over 18, I want you to think about this. And people that are under 18, I want you to think about this too, right? So it's, what, Friday night on November 15th, <laughs> 8, 11 p.m., right? And if you're under 18 years old, you're at Fermilab right now, <laughs> getting ready to watch physics. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Like, how cool is that, really? I mean, you could be doing lots of things. Like, my son probably is playing Pokemon. I'm hoping he's watching physics when he's your age. But I just think that's fan I think I, 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 uh, it makes me want, it makes me almost want to cry because, well, almost want to cry. It makes me want to cry because there's young people here right now that are learning about physics. And young people that are 18, look, I'm going to tell you right now, you're, you're going to save my planet. I mean, I'm telling you right now. Like, when I watched the people that are speaking tonight, I thought, you're going to save my planet. You're going to say, <laughs> you can explain human existence. <laughs> and people, if you're under 18, that's what you're going to do. Like, that, that, that's what you're going to do. You're here at Fermilab on a Friday night at 8 o'clock with your parents, maybe with your friends. You're going to save the world. That's, that's something amazing. And I don't want you to stop. I don't want you to... <laughs> like, I don't want you guys over here to forget that. Okay? When you get to high school... Don't forget that. When she tells you to do something, you just do it. Do your physics. Yes. You just shut up and do your physics. Got it? Yeah. yeah. You give me your name later, I'll call you in, I don't even know how many years, but soon. You can have mac and cheese or whatever, but do your physics. I just, I don't know, whatever. I just keep walking by appreciating that, because I, I never did. And now I'm just happy that I get to be a, a speech professor at College of DuPage that has a friend, Tom Carter, who likes me and asked me to be the host of the, of the physics slam, and now I get to sit here and watch something that I, at age 40, I wish that I had done at age 15. And so I think that's absolutely fantastic that you're here. So you people in the front, enjoy with everything that's going to happen, because you're going to you're going to love everything that's going to happen tonight. I know. Thumbs up, my brother. <laughs> you keep it up. <laughs> anyway, so here's what's going to happen tonight. So you're going to watch five speakers that are going to be teaching you about physics, okay? Now, this isn't just a regular physics discussion, okay? One thing I've learned about physics, but physicians? But, 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 but people that teach physics <laughs> is that they can't talk for a short period of time, right? <laughs> I, I, I guess when I guess when you tell a person that teaches physics, you give them 10 minutes, they think it's four days. That's, what that, that's the joke I've been told. So what we tell them tonight is that you get 10 minutes. You get 10 minutes and you get 10 minutes only. So 
They have to talk about their research, their interests, their skills, their talents, whatever, you know, puts them here in Fermi Lab and makes them, makes them wonderful, beautiful people, but they got to do it within 10 minutes. So, we have a timer in the front row, and he's going to have a 10-minute time limit, okay? Now, we did the end. Applaud, yell, scream, stomp your feet, yell, boot, holler, didn't I hear a horn? There it is. If they happen to go over 10 minutes, that should be some sort of a deduction for them, okay? Um, I'm not saying you know, to applaud for them, but they're supposed to be under 10 minutes. Now, I've watched them in rehearsal. Some of them perhaps may have go over 10 minutes. Um, but, because <laughs> they're physicists. <laughs> but they're not going to go, they're not going to go, they're physicists. They're not physicians, it's like a doctor. But they're all doctors too, which is a great thing. Um, <laughs> but they're physicists, so they're going to talk long. Um, but like I said, they're supposed to go under 10 minutes long. Okay, so just, you know, keep that in consideration. We'll bring them out and we'll applaud for them and that'll be great. Also, at the end of this entire thing, um, I will uh, also, I'm going to dismiss them uh, when they're all finished with this, so please stay in your seats. When I do get after our question, and when it's all over, we're going to have a, about a 12 to 15 minute question and answer session. So feel free to ask them questions. And then I'll kick them out quickly and they're going to run to the back lobby so you can swarm them and get their autographs because they're pretty famous people. At least I think that they are. You can should think they're famous too. They could win a, no they could win a, Nobel, a Nobel Prize one day. So you might want to, you know, <laughs> why not? Hey, my belt is up with you. You might want to, you know, get their autograph because that's a big deal. Okay? So keep that in mind. You're going to apply for them at the end of today's presentations. So, are you ready to go? I see our first speaker is ready, so here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, our first of five speakers this evening, please put your hands together for Dr. Don Lincoln. Welcome to Fermilab, science fans. Are you ready to hear about some awesome research? Yeah! No, no, no. Are you ready to hear about some awesome research? Yeah! That's better. That's what I wanted to hear. So let's get started. I'm going to blow your mind. <laughs> the universe began about 14 billion years ago in a cataclysmic explosion that we call the Big Bang. Since then, the universe has been expanding and cooling, leading to the familiar night sky we see today. Scientists and philosophers have long wanted to understand in detail exactly how the universe came into existence. And the best way to do that would be to somehow be able to study it in a laboratory. And of course, this has been impossible. Well, until now. It turns out it is possible to turn back the clock and recreate the Big Bang in our laboratory and study it in excruciating detail. At large particle physics laboratories, my colleagues and I collide subatomic particles traveling at nearly the speed of light together inside these big detectors. The temperatures at the center of these collisions are incredible. They're 100,000 times hotter than the center of sun. They are 10, or 10 times hotter than the center of a supernova, which is the explosion of a star that is so dramatic and so cataclysmic that you can see it across half the universe. 
the, we, these temperatures were not common in the universe. Um, or has, with the last time they were common in the universe, it was a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, a trillionth with a T. This really is the very cauldron of creation, the foundry in which the universe itself was formed. So you might ask yourself where this is done. Well, for 25 years, it was done about 500 feet that away, and it was an amazing story. But that time has passed, and the, the, uh, the torch has passed to Europe. So I do a lot of my research at the Large Hadron Collider. So this kind of shows you what it's like. The Large Hadron Collider is huge. It's 18 miles around. To give you a sense of scale, that's the size of the Fermilab accelerator right out there. And this here is an international airport capable of landing a 747. This thing is really big. This is what the accelerator looks like. It's a tunnel. The tunnel's a little higher than I can reach. It's really quite large. And you can see these are the magnets wrapping around inside this red ring here. I can show you a little bit more what it looks like. So here is the, uh, the LHC. There are four experiments around it, LHCB, ATLAS, ALICE, and CMS. CMS is the experiment that Fermilab is on. Now this is a little bit misleading because this is 18 miles around and the experiments are only 300 feet underground. But this gives you an idea of what it looks like. Now to actually look at the CMS detector itself, well here's a picture of what it looks like. The CMS detector is absolutely enormous. It is 50 feet long, or 50 feet wide, 50 feet high, 70 feet long. It weighs 14,000 tons. You can think of it as a, a camera with 100 million pixels. Now, this cell phone has a camera with 13 million pixels, so this is only six times the size. So you say, well, what's, that's not a very big deal. Except, can your smartphone take 40 million pictures a second? This one can. Um, and to give you a real kind of idea of what it looks like, that guy, that's a guy my size. This thing is really absolutely enormous. So we have a neat photograph here. These are some of the people who work on the CMS experiment. It takes an awful lot of people to build and maintain and run a detector like this. Here in the back we see, this is actually a photograph, but it's a life-size photograph. This thing is three stories high. There are 3,000 people on CMS. 1,000 of them come from American institutions. 70 of them come from Fermilab, including myself. Now, as we go through the evening, you have to ask yourself, we're going to talk about physics, but you have to decide which one is kind of the neatest. And what's the biggest questions in the universe? Well, it's how the universe is held together. And that might be said in, in this way. What are the ultimate rules of the universe? What is the ultimate rules of matter and energy, space and time? Now, I can tell you some of the things that CMS does, and, uh, and you can judge for yourself. So here's a question that's really interesting. We want to search for the ultimate building blocks of matter in the universe. So, you guys have heard of molecules, yes? You've heard of, you know about atoms, yes? You've heard about protons, neutrons, and electrons, yes? These are all smaller. Some of you even heard that protons and neutrons have things inside them called quarks, right? Did you know that it's possible that there might be something inside quarks? Well, we don't know that, but here, we don't know that, but we're looking for that. So here, as we go into a molecule, you see an atom, protons, neutrons, quarks, and what we're looking for is the next layer in this subatomic onion, the smallest part, building blocks of the universe. And this is something that CMS has studied and actually has results on. Uh, we haven't found it yet, but we have the best measurements of, of any other accelerator can be done at the Large Hadron Collider. Another question that's interesting is, what was the universe like when it began? And here you have a photograph of a uh, collision between two nuclei of lead atoms. You take a lead atom, you rip the electrons off, two of them, smash them together. The temperatures at the center of this collision are so hot that the protons and neutrons melt, and the particles inside them scurry around willy-nilly, and that's what you're seeing there. Now, there's a lot of people on this experiment. Is there any way to quantify the scientific impact of an experiment that large? Can you even count it? And the answer is, well, yes, actually you can. And one way to do that is to actually maybe look at the scientific papers that have come out of it. So here is, you know, a couple of the papers that have come out of this experiment. <laughs> it's a tremendous thing. There are 300 scientific publications that have come out of this. And so, well, that's the impact. I mean, that's, that's what we do, and that's it. No, actually, there is one thing. I forgot about it. There's one other thing we did. There's this little thing called the origins of mass in the universe, and this is something that CMS knows a little bit about, and so you might have heard that in the press. The press like to say it's the God particle. Well, scientists and, you know, whether you're religious or atheist, this is a stupid name for it. You should never call it that. We should call it what it is. It's the Higgs boson. 
Now, the prediction of the Higgs boson required the input of two of the most brilliant minds on the planet. And so here we have... <laughs> So here we have Peter Higgs, and oh, oh wait a minute, you, you thought I meant me? No, this is just a picture that I took with him when I had dinner with him this summer. <laughs> but Peter Higgs is the real deal. In 1964, he and five other people came up with a bunch of ideas that then led to the prediction of the Higgs boson. And so this work was um, acknowledged by the scientific community. And when uh, Peter Higgs on the right and Francois Englert on the left shared the 2013 Nobel Prize just four or five weeks ago. That's pretty cool. I wasn't involved in the prediction. I was, shall we say, <laughs> I was a lot shorter when they made the prediction, but I was involved in the discovery of that. On July 4th, 2012, Dr. Joe Candela, head of the CMS experiment, announced the discovery of the Higgs boson. He announced it in the CERN main auditorium, a room very much like this. And you can see it was to a packed house full of some of the brightest minds in the, on the planet. But this was not just interesting scientifically. The public thought it was cool too. I mean, it was really shocking. Over a thousand television stations had 5,000 broadcasts to a billion with a B people. The, I mean, the, the, the world cared. And that was amazing because particle physics doesn't always get that kind of recognition. And it wasn't just the mainstream media that found it was interesting. Celebrities like Will I Am, MC Hammer, with, <laughs> with millions of Twitter followers so, uh, saw these tweets. And so that's just really kind of cool. So <clears throat> I can't tell you all of the things that CMS can do. There's just too much that, I, that, that we do. Um, but what I can tell you is we can study all of the aspects of the standard model. The standard model is our, you know, our model of the universe. It's made of quarks, leptons, these force-carrying particles, and now this ghostly field, the Higgs field, that wraps it all together. And CMS has made world-class measurements on everything you see here. The LHC is now turned off, and it's for refurbishment and repair and things like that. Um, in about a year, we'll turn back on and start running. And so you might want to ask yourself, well, what will we find then? We found the Higgs boson, what's next? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I know what we're looking for, things like supersymmetry, extra dimensions, technicolor, and all these things that are popping out behind me. Um, but the thing that's really exciting is we might find something totally unexpected. I mean, it's even possible, possible, mind you, that we could even find Elvis. <laughs> No, 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 I, 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 this guy's really thought that was exciting. I, I'm sorry, it, it's, it's, it's likely. No, no, it's not likely, but it, yeah, okay, maybe. I hope so. Um, so, the, the, the real answer to what are you going to find is very simple. It was said by Einstein, if I knew what I was doing, it wouldn't be called research, now would it? <laughs> so, however, as I kind of wrap, I, w I want you to think about what we can do here. There is something absolutely amazing about mankind able to recreate the universe in the laboratory and metaphorically hold it in our hands and study it. And that is absolutely the most amazing science I can possibly think of. And with that, thank you for coming. <laughs> Dr. Don Lincoln, everybody. All right. Well, here you go. Yeah, go ahead. You can applaud if you like to applaud. Now, let's move on to our second speaker of the evening. Everyone, please welcome to the stage Dr. Tia Michelli. Gentlemen, I'm Detective Tia Michelli, and I'm going to be showing you some case files that we've been studying about neutrinos here. Two of them are historical, and the final one is one that we're working on right now at Fermilab. So let's go to the first file tonight. It calls into question if energy is conserved or not. So I wasn't really sure about this, so I had one of my colleagues videotape my cat. <laughs> So from 
goodness. I learned that indeed energy is conserved. It just changes forms. So the energy of my cat's motion as he jumps into the air is transformed into potential energy at the apex of his jump and then changes again into kinetic energy at the end as he falls back down. So throughout this whole process, the total energy is the same. It just changes forms. So the total energy initially is equal to the total energy finally. And this is the, the law of conservation of energy. So at the beginning of the 1900s, physicists also believed in this law. I mean, they didn't see my cat video yet, but. So they were really sure that this law was right. So they were very surprised when they were studying bismuth decays. Now, bismuth is an atom that decays in two steps. The first step is an alpha decay step, where it de the bismuth decays to an alpha particle and an intermediate particle. And they checked conservation of energy here and saw that it worked perfectly. The total energy at the start equaled the total energy finally. But wait for the second step, the actual beta decay step. So physicists were actually very surprised here when they checked the conservation of energy, they found that it wasn't conserved. The products had too little energy. Was some agent stealing this energy or was the, con the law of energy wrong? So physicists weren't sure. But in 1930, this very famous physicist, Wolfgang Pauli, had an idea and he was due to present it at a very prestigious conference in Germany. But instead of going to the conference, he went out dancing with his friends. <laughs> so instead of getting in trouble for that, he sent a letter instead. And so the leaders of the conference had to read that letter out loud. Liebe radioaktive Damen und Herren, or Dear Radioactive Ladies and Gentlemen. <laughs> So in this letter, Polly proposed that there's an invisible particle stealing the energy away from this bismuth decay. And he was almost right. There was a particle stealing it away, but it wasn't quite invisible. And this particle will be the neutrino. So for the next 20 years, physicists looked like bounty hunters everywhere for this. They really wanted to find this neutrino, building detectors everywhere. And it wasn't until 1955 at the Savannah River nuclear reactor that physicists built these tanks of water to detect the neutrinos. And then in 1956, Clyde and Frederick finally caught this neutrino. And they sent a telegram at once to Polly overseas saying, we are happy to inform you that we have definitely detected neutrinos. So case closed. Is energy conserved? Yes, it is. In this decay, the neutrino was stealing away the energy. Which brings us to file two, that of the missing neutrinos. So first I have a question for you. How many of you have had Neapolitan ice cream before? <laughs> All right. Yummy, right? So it turns out that neutrinos also come in three flavors. Electron flavor, muon flavor, and tau flavor. So we'll start with this in the, in the 60s, that there's three flavors of neutrinos. Also in the 60s, this guy, John Bacall, was studying what makes the sun shine. He was studying nuclear fusion in the sun, and he was calculating that how many neutrinos come out of the sun. And he said, on Earth, in every square centimeter, there'll be 60 billion neutrinos per second. And that's just such a phenomenal number. I mean, so he wanted to make sure that it was right. So he ended up teaming up with experimentalist Ray Davis and in, at the Homestake Mine experiment. And Ray Davis built this giant detector of chlorine to, to capture these neutrinos. And he was able to see neutrinos, but he only saw one out of every three that he expected. So where were these other neutrinos going? I mean, Ray Davis was really sure that his experiment was right. I mean, this is his job to, 
you know, build these things. But then John Bacall was really sure that his math was right. I mean, he took like a million math classes. How could he be wrong? <laughs> so it wasn't until 1968 that these fellows proposed an idea. Perhaps neutrinos oscillate in flavor. So that would mean that if you start out with an electron flavor neutrino and it travels through space, it can quantum mechanically oscillate into a muon flavor or a tau flavor or back into an electron flavor neutrino. And it wasn't until the late 1990s that we finally had conclusive evidence that this was the case. At Super Kamio Kande in Japan and at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, they confirmed that there's three types of neutrinos oscillating into each other. At the Sudbury experiment, they were able to detect all three neutrino flavors. And the rate that they saw, it matched exactly the rate that Bacall predicted. So all those math classes paid off and he was right. So let me share with you a little bit about what neutrino oscillations uh, mean quantum mechanically. So an electron neutrino can transform into a muon neutri flavor neutrino at a certain, with a certain probability. And that can be shown with this graph. And it can also be shown or be heard as an audio example, like this one. Thanks, guys, but I don't think anyone believes that's what neutrino sounds like. Have a... There we go. That's what I wanted. Thank you. And then also, the electron flavor neutrino can oscillate into a tau flavor neutrino at a slightly different frequency. And then these two probabilities can quantum mechanically interfere with each other when you combine them. And it will sound something like this. So you hear it gets loud and soft, loud and soft. When it's loud, the neutrino has oscillated to a different flavor. When it's soft, the neutrino has stayed an electron flavor neutrino. So finally, case closed. We found out where the missing neutrinos were going. They weren't actually missing. They were just hiding as different flavors. So we got those. And next is our last case, file three, one, that we're, one that's still open and that we're working on right now at Fermilab. It's called, it's about symmetry violations. So what do I mean by symmetry violations? Well, we know in the very early universe when it first began, we think there's a symmetry with matter and antimatter and that they were produced in equal amounts. And eventually as the universe evolved, the matter and antimatter particles came together and annihilated to radiation. But by the time that we came about, we know that the universe was filled with just matter. I mean, just look around this room. We're all made out of matter, not antimatter. So why is that? We weren't expecting that. Scientists don't know the answer. But we hope that neutrinos can help, help us figure out what the answer is. By studying neutrino oscillations and anti-neutrino oscillations, we hope that any differences we see may be able to account for this mystery. And right now at Fermilab, we have many different experiments ongoing, and I'm a postdoc with New Mexico State University working on the microboon experiment. And in the future, we will have the LBNE experiment, which will detect neutrinos in South Dakota in the same mine where neutrinos were first discovered. Stay tuned as we uncover this last mystery. Thank you, Dr. Tia. Matt, you also heard our bell. So now you have an idea of what it sounds like. Although she was just only slightly over. So we're getting a volunteer to come downstage with her mother, so please step back there. They'll show you where to go. 
Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, go back there, Haley. Thank you. I got this file. Okay, now our third speaker of this evening, who is almost ready to go. Um, all right. <laughs> Just turn out. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dr. Walter Hugh Lippincott. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Hugh Lippincott. Because I have a time limit, we should get going. Uh, I want to talk about dark matter tonight. So, let's begin. Uh, there's a pretty strong consensus about how much stuff that there is in the universe, that we think is in the universe. But if you add up the stuff we understand, the stuff that makes up me, the stuff that makes up you, the Earth, the stars in the sky at night, that's about 5% of this total, which means that 95% of the universe is a mystery to humanity, which is a pretty strong statement when you think about it, that so much of this world is unknown to us. Now, we know some things about this. And in fact, we can sort of try to make a little pie chart, as you can see down here. And about three quarters of the universe, we believe is something called dark energy. And I'm going to leave that subject for my colleague, Brian Nord, later in the session. Uh, but what I want to talk to you guys about is dark matter. So we believe dark matter is about a quarter of the universe. And in fact, the vast majority of matter in the universe is made up of this stuff that we call dark matter. Now, a reasonable person might ask, well, how do we know? That's a pretty good question. And the answer, as it often is in case in physics, is from observations. So people have been looking at the sky for a really long time. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, a man named Fritz Vicky, back in the 1930s, uh, who was apparently not very well liked by his colleagues, because this is the picture that you always see of Dr. Zwicky, <laughs> <laughs> even though very nice ones do exist. <laughs> um, but Fritz would make observations of clusters of galaxies. And he was followed in the 1970s by a, uh, a scientist named Vera Rubin, who was looking at the galaxies themselves. What both of these observers noticed was that uh, galaxies and stars were moving too fast to be bound by the amount of visible matter in those galaxies. So this is a key point, so I want to focus on it for a minute. <clears throat> in a galaxy, uh, you can imagine the stars are orbiting around the center of the galaxy, much as the Earth orbits around the sun in our solar system. Now, that, the force that is holding that together is gravity. And for those of you who have taken uh, physics in college or high school or will take physics in college or high school, and I hope that is all of you, you will learn that the force of gravity is proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the distance. So what that effectively means is that I am being more attracted to this side of the auditorium right now than I am that side of the auditorium. No offense over there. It's just because I'm standing this close. <laughs> OK. So gravity is what's pulling these things around. The next thing that you will learn in physics is about circular motion. And that is that to keep an object bound, you need a force that's equal to the velocity over the distance. OK. So you can put these two things together. Actually, let me illustrate that last point with my very high-tech demo of a ball on a string that I made today in the lab. Uh, <laughs> so as I swing this around, if I swing it harder, I have to hold onto the ball much, much harder. Otherwise, it'll just fly away, and it'll be unbound by my galaxy. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> OK, so Zwicky and uh, Vera Rubin were making observations of these galaxies. And if you put those two things together, here's a statement that you might be able to say. If all of the mass in the galaxy was in the bright part of the galaxy, then the speed with which things are moving should drop as you leave the bright part of the galaxy. It's because there's no more mass, but you're farther away. So you have to go slower to remain bound by that galaxy. So you might expect to see, if you're plotting the velocity versus distance, something that looks like this red line, something that drops to zero because, again, the fast-moving stars become unbound and, and, and are no longer in the galaxy itself. What these observers noticed was that, actually, the velocity stays high to very, very large radii, well beyond the bright part of the galaxy. So that was some evidence that there had to be some matter there that we weren't seeing. And that's what we call dark matter. OK, so if you believe me that it exists, the next question you might ask, well, what is it? <laughs> well, we can say some things about it based on these observations. We know it interacts via gravity. We know that it is uh, dark in the sense that it doesn't interact with light. Otherwise, we would have seen it already. So well, that sort of sounds like the neutrinos that Tia was talking about a moment ago. <clears throat> they interacted via the weak force. Maybe dark matter does too, and that's why we haven't seen it. And so that leads us to the very cute acronym, the WIMP, or the Weakly Interacting Massive Particle, which is a very literal thing. It's a particle, it has mass, interacts via gravity, it interacts weakly. It's just very, very rare. So I spend all my time looking for wimps. <clears throat> <laughs> now, astrophysics tells us that there might be, uh, we can understand the density of how much there are. And so if everybody in the audience would make a fist for me without hitting your neighbor, <clears throat> there is probably a dark matter particle in your hand right now. 
because they're always coming through streaming by. Now, in a very sensitive radiation detector, something like that might go off a couple of times per year, and you might be able to detect that. So that sounds pretty easy, right? We know how to build radiation detectors. Let's just do this. The problem, of course, is that there's radioactivity everywhere. And so if I have my sensitive radiation detector, it's going to go off about 100 times per second per kilogram. <clears throat> now, that's a trillion times a year in a big detector because of things like radon. If you run your home, you're familiar with that. Bananas turn out to be radioactive. There's really pretty much radioactivity everywhere. So that trillion events in my detector, and I'm looking for five, this is a difficult problem. So this is where I would like to have some audience participation. We're going to try and mimic that experiment here today uh, in this auditorium. So can my volunteer come on stage? <laughs> Hi, I'm Hugh. What's your name? Haley. Haley, thank you very much for taking part. So Haley, what we're going to do here is I have in the audience a friend of mine named Kelly, okay? And I'm going to ask you to try and find Kelly when I ask the audience to do certain things, okay? You ready for that? Then you're just going to stand here looking cute for a long time after that, okay? All right, good. Haley, thank you very much. All right, the audience, I'm going to need something from you too. Uh, when I uh, give you a category, if you fit that category, I would like you to clap your hands three times like this. Okay, so that's pretty basic. Let's just practice it right now. Can everybody please clap your hands? Perfect. All right. So, are you ready to do the first experiment? All right. If you live in the United States, would you please clap your hands three times? Where's Kelly? Oh, yeah, let's make it a little easier on you, all right? So this is a uh, background. She's looking for the needle in a haystack, and that's very difficult. Okay, so in a dark matter experiment, some of those backgrounds come from cosmic rays. Now, cosmic rays are very highly energetic particles. They're coming to the atmosphere all the time. But in a dark matter experiment, those, we don't want those. So what can we do to get around from them? Well, maybe we can go underground and shield us from that. So let's watch this video for a second. This is actually where my experiment takes place. In the snow uh, cavern that Tia mentioned earlier, they've now built a bigger lab. So this is, uh, this is my experiment. You get up in the morning at about 5 o'clock in the morning. You put on your hard hat, your uh, headlamp. You put on your mining gear. And you drop a mile and a quarter under the ground <coughs> where you find yourself in a mine, which is really exciting. Then you will truck, uh, you'll truck about two kilometers through a drift. That's a tunnel that looks exactly like that. That's one of my good friends there. Uh, and eventually, at the end of this tunnel, you find yourself on the set of a 1980s science fiction movie. <coughs> <laughs> whitewashed walls, uh, but they've built this underground lab there, and my experiment is actually running right now in a place like this. Okay, so in our local experiment, to get rid of the cosmic rays, we've gone underground. So <clears throat> what I would like from the audience is if you were a scientist, you're no longer taking part in my experiment. So Haley, you ready to try again? Okay, if the audience, if you are from the United States and you are not a scientist, would you please clap three times? <laughs> How do we do? <laughs> okay. We can go a little bit further. <coughs> uh, radioactive contaminants turn out to be radioactive, as clearly. Uh, rocks, radioactive right on the air we mentioned. My thumbprint actually can be radioactive. So let's try and be clean, shall we? Are you ready to try and get some, a little bit cleaner? I'm going to put on a hairnet. Not entirely sure why I need a hairnet, but... Okay, I got my lab coat. If I can get it on. I am running out of time. Oh no, I'll just drape it around my shoulders. This is poor lab uh, etiquette. <laughs> this is my boss putting together his detector. Again, he's making sure he doesn't sweat into it. Uh, so, okay, so our experiment, we have uh, radioactive contaminants. We're going clean, we're shielding. Now in the audience, you are only participating if you play fantasy football. So are you ready to do this again? Okay. If you are in the United States, if you are not a scientist and you play fantasy football, would you please clap your hands three times? <laughs> Almost, right? We're getting close to there. There's only like 20 people left, I think. All right, so let's do one more thing to make it easy for you. Uh, one other background source. <clears throat> well, it turns out that the detector itself can be radioactive. The thing you're holding your detector in can be radioactive. That's a problem. So now let's see if there's something about the signal that can distinguish it from the background. So is there something that's going to tell it exactly what we want and get rid of everything else? For example, a characteristic white sweater and a hat. And maybe we can see what we're looking for. Okay. This is my experiment. This is a bubble chamber. Uh, literally, I sit here and watch bubbles form in a jar all day long. Uh, that's a sign of radioactivity passing through. That's an issue of those bubbles. But also, the bubbles make sounds, and we can use those sounds to pull out what we're looking for. So for example, this is what dark matter might sound like in my chamber. Okay. This is what a common background event, an alpha, might sound like in my chamber. I right, listen to those both together, and you can see if you can tell the difference, all right? Can you tell the difference between those two? The second one was louder, right? Nod your head, because it was. <laughs> okay. So the second one was louder. 
So we're going to use that discrimination to try and make this experiment one more time. All right, so I would now only like people who have graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago to take part in my experiment. Haley, are you ready? Okay, is everybody ready? If you live in the United States, if you are not a scientist, if you play fantasy football and you graduate from the Art School of the Art Institute of Chicago, would you please clap your hands three times? Can you find her? You have just won the Nobel Prize. And actually, I think I have a, uh, I do. Here is Haley's Nobel Prize. <laughs> you guys are all invited to the party. Thank you very much. Great, have a great time. <laughs> Let's give it up for Haley one more time. <laughs> And yes, Haley, you can keep all that stuff, the hair net and jacket. <laughs> Keeps you clean. Thank you very much, Dr. Hugh. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome to the stage our fourth speaker of the evening, Dr. Chris Polly. So it's no secret how I got invited to this little shindig. Everybody at this laboratory knows that I have an obsession. It's not the normal kind of obsession either, I'm sorry to say. It's not a car. It's not money. It's not even a woman. Well, actually, I'm kind of obsessed with my wife. Uh, love you, Kimberly. Especially when you're sitting close enough to throw things. But she knows that I have another obsession. And it's with a subatomic particle, so there's no, not much competition there. <laughs> In fact, it's this one. This is a muon. This is the standard table of what we know about the universe, the parts that are in it. You might guess from this, it's kind of like an electron. And it is. It set, sets right next to it. It has the same charge. It's 200 times heavier, but oddly enough, it doesn't seem to be made of anything. It still seems to be a point particle. What you can't see from this table <laughs> is that the muon is the Elvis of the subatomic world. And you'll believe me by the time I'm done. First of all, muons are rebels. Why are they rebels? Because until they were discovered in 1935, everything fit in nice little convenient boxes. The, when the muon was discovered, they broke the mold. Suddenly you couldn't describe things as little packages of protons and neutrons and electrons. This was something very different. In fact, so different, you had to go to a very strange place even to find it initially. The top of Pike's Peak, as it turns out, with a little detector like you see here. This is a 1935-era cloud chamber. Um, just to show you what it looks like when you discover a new particle, there's one in here. That's one of the actual cloud chamber photographs. If you can see the muon, it's the heavier track. It's easy there, right? There it is. It's not always that easy, though. This one's a little messier. But if you look close, there it is. The curvature of these tracks tells you it's something completely new, nothing that's ever been seen before. I'll also point out, that these two muons were born in 1935, the same year that Elvis was. <laughs> Secondly, muons live fast and they die young. It's unfortunate for all of us, I know. Really short, two millionths of a second you get to look at a muon when we make them here at Fermilab before they transform into an ordinary electron and two of the ghost-like neutrinos you heard about from Tia. There's one more very, very important point, and that's they gyrate. Literally. Maybe not quite like that, but very similar. Imagine you have a magnetic field. I've drawn one on the board here. You put a muon in there, and it will process. It will revolve just like the gyroscope some of you might have played with um, as kids, or are still playing with if you're kids or adults. Remember, though, they're unstable. They decay into these electrons. So that means if you put a group of them on the dance floor and you stand out to synchronize their steps and stand outside, you'll see that they uh, revolve and you'll see a beacon of the electrons shining out from the dance floor. So why the obsession? Simply because I believe we can reveal the secrets of the universe by watching how the muons dance in that magnetic field. Sounds crazy, I know. But take a look at this picture. The universe is crazy. This is a picture made with a camera constructed here at Fermilab that's on top of a mountain in Chile right now. Zoom in on a particular frame. 
you can see beautiful galaxies, much like the spiral galaxy we live in. But what about the empty spaces? Zoom in on an empty frame. Zoom in further. Is there anything there? Is there in, your, in the cold, dark, deep, vast coldness of outer space? Well, if you zoom in close enough to the subatomic level, it turns out empty space is anything but empty. A better analogy is a seething cauldron of particles constantly boiling up out of the vacuum, appearing, disappearing. This is very important because the muon, as it dances in that magnetic field, also sees those particles. And they jump up like momentary dance partners that can speed up or slow down the revolution of the muons in that magnetic field. That's why we call the frequency of this revolution the gyromagnetic ratio. So let's talk about this number, G. Starting with the first digit, what I've got here is, you know, what experimentalists measure and what theorists would predict based on the known universe. That's the first digit of it, and already there's a huge amount of information in that first digit. Starting with Dirac's equation, this is his, his famous equation that for the first time merged quantum mechanics and relativity. It predicted that this digit should be two, and this is the proof that quantum mechanics and relativity are the, are, are the reality of the world. Furthermore, this equation, even though Dirac didn't know it, also predicted the existence of antimatter. Pushing down further into the depths of the number, you can see that something scary happens. At first, it looks like there's nothing else there. It could have been a desert, no more physics to discover in the 20th century. It would have been horrible. Um, bad job security for us, too, I must say. <laughs> but you push one more digit, and back the next four digits, something entirely new happens. Now the dance partners appear in the vacuum to dance with the muons. First, it's the electrons and the photons, the things that govern, elect govern electricity and magnetism. Here you can see a Feynman diagram. That's, this is how we visualize the dance a muon passing by, interacting with the magnetic field, and one of the particles fluctuating, in this case a photon, out of the field. But we're still not done. Push to the next two digits. Suddenly the quarks in the world appear, the quarks you heard about earlier, the quarks that are responsible for binding the strong, the strong force that binds nuclei together. Without this force, every nucleus in this room would explode if it suddenly went away. Pushing down one more digit. Now a very strange dance partner emerges. The W and Z bosons. These are, the, uh, these are the, the fundamental particles that make some nuclei unstable no matter what. And they're also responsible for the muon only living two millionths of a second. So pushing beyond that, things become a little more hazy. Things become less clear. We just can't do experiments that precise. The theoreticians can't calculate the digits that far, although people uh, keep trying. You can see, taking these numbers and putting them on a plot based on all the particles we know about that should appear in the vacuum, you can see something amazing has already happened. Two digits before things became unclear, the experiment and the theory diverged. Here you can see the points plotted, the relative uncertainties on the experiment and the theory, and the question is, what is living in this space? It could be it's a theory like supersymmetry that would predict another tablet of particles, very similar but heavier to the ones we have very well-motivated theory based on uh, controlling the Higgs mass. It could be the dark matter particles that Hugh talked to you about. Those same particles that are causing universes, to, uh, galaxies to look heavier could be what's appearing and being the new dance partners disturbing the, uh, the experiment, not yet in the theory. So just to recap the physics of the dance, essentially every single revolutionary theory in the 20th century all appears in a single number. That's not bad. But we think we can do better. In fact, right now as we speak, theoretical physicists across the world are putting giant supercomputers to work trying to crunch to get the number for that next digit in the sequence. At the same time, the experimentalists have also been very busy. Just out of curiosity, did anybody in here hear about a giant magnet that was traveling across the country this year? If you did, make some noise. That's right. This magnet traveled 3,800 miles from New York to Chicago. It traveled, you see, by land, by sea, through the rivers, just to get it to Fermilab. Here's some pictures of it. It's a 50-foot diameter device. You can see there's, it's, a superconducting, it's a superconducting coil. The part of the device that's, uh, that's used for experiments is the silver part. This is a giant frame that was constructed because this 50-foot device could not shift or bend by more than an eighth of an inch. It was an impressive engineering challenge, but that's why we hire good engineers here. You can see, 
Here it is traveling by land, being put on a barge, coming by the St. Louis Arch. And it took, we really had to make miracles happen to get this device here. We shut down two interstates in Chicago. <laughs> here you can see the interstate closed with the trucks blocking it off, coming through the, the tollway, paying our, paying our toll. <laughs> and of course, to make this happen, we really had to spread the obsession. Look at the number of people involved, our state troopers, the crew of, of people it took to move this magnet, and the 3,000 people that came to Fermilab to see it arrive, and the thousands that came to see it along its voyage. So it was, a, it was an amazing event. However, now all of you know exactly what it's for and can tell your friends. You see, this is actually the new dance floor for the muons. I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So, uh, just to remind you, real quickly, we have one more speaker left to go, and we're going to get set up for our final speaker. But just to remind you one more time, when we get done with our final speaker, we're going to vote for the uh, five speakers that, are, uh, that have presented tonight. So we're going to be asking for your applause, your hoots and your hollers, your horns. Thank you very much, horn. There it is. I should have queued you up before. <laughs> And also remember, though, we'll have some uh, question and answer as well for about 12, you know, 10, 12, 15 minutes, whatever. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to stay in your seats for a couple of seconds so the, all, of, all of our five speakers can be outside in the lobby in case you want to ask some questions one-on-one. -on -one. All right? So I just want to let you know how uh, it's going. So are you enjoying your physics land? <laughs> I know. I've seen these speeches like four times, and I still am sitting in the back <laughs> loving every moment of it. So, we are going to now... <laughs> we have a cast of characters coming out. I am not going to introduce our last speaker by name. I'm going to let the presentation speak for itself. So, ladies and gentlemen, speaker number five. Star date November 15, 3031, and this is your Cosmic Nightly News. And now, here's your host, Godfather Brian D. Nord, PhD Esquire the Third. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the Cosmic Nation. Now, that move back in the 1983, back in 1983, was called the Moonwalk. Little did they know that here in the year 3031, we will be broadcasting live from the moon. That's right. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We've got a great story for you. Top story tonight is the issue on everyone's minds. That's right. We are in an epic battle for the fate of the cosmos, and indeed, for the fate of the Cosmic Nation. On one side, a truly conservative gravity pulling us together, and on the other, runaway expansion tearing us apart. So let's dive in. Budget Watch 3031. <laughs> the U.S. hasn't published uh, an on-time fiscal budget no a thousand years. <laughs> And those two sides will never agree, so let's focus on something we can actually understand. That's right, I'm talking about the cosmic energy budget. Now see, Nation, this is the epic conflict between gravity and expansion. This is all the energy, all the stuff in the universe. But let me break it down for you. See that, uh, that beautiful bright blue shiny sliver there? That's us, we are the 5%, okay? <laughs> That is all the, all the visible matter in the universe, from electrons to elephants. Make no mistake about it, nation, that is the most important 5%. You know how I know? 
We are the life creators, okay? But remember, we can no longer treat our good friend dark matter as if it's still invisible. See, it feels gravity just the way we do. It's just like us. And it takes up 25% of that energy budget. Okay. Now, you might remember about 1,500 years ago, our old homeboy Newton, he showed us... <laughs> that's right. Yeah, he showed us exactly how easy gravity is. That uh, it, it holds together atoms, planets, elephants, anything that has mass. Okay? Even slinkies. All right? Uh, so easy, actually, even an apple can get it right. <laughs> now, Newton said that gravity is what holds our solar system together. And I say good enough for the Earth, good enough for the universe. Okay. Now, Cosmic Nation, um, what I want to get at here is the next, next issue in this fight, the other side here. We've got one runaway expansion program after another. That's right, we've had the Big Bang that started it all with no oversight, mind you. And then we had, then we had an inflationary expansion, exponential expansion. Since then, we've been coasting, but the universe is still handing out parcels of space to freeloaders left and right. Okay. That's right. See, Nation, even the anti-gravity expansionists, they'll, do, they'll, they'll only support uh, these space entitlement programs. Now, in fact, they're doing nothing about the accelerating expansion of the universe. Now, I don't want to scare you too much, nation, but, uh, you know, as we know, the universe is getting bigger and less efficient, but now it's happening faster, okay? And this is due to dark energy, which takes up a whopping 70% of that energy budget. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is this dark energy? Okay. Well, back in the 1990s, some of our revered scientists studied some supernovae, some exploding stars all over the universe, and they found that they're moving away from us faster and faster. Actually, little known fact, Nation, and we had our interns do some work on this, the, uh, there's a knucklehead by the name Einstein, actually, who figured all this out 100 years before those guys, but he changed his equations to fit with the fashionable theories of the day. Just think, if he had stuck to his guns, he might have been famous. <laughs> Now, in the light of all this darkness, I want you to remember one thing. To destroy thy enemy, one must know thy enemy. And that's why I'm in favor of all this work that's gone into studying dark energy. For example, way back in 2013, Fermilab put together the Dark Energy Cam, or DE Cam. That's right. This 570 megapixel beauty could see 8 billion light years away. These fine folks at Fermilab reached out tried to understand dark energy, tried to reason with it. <laughs> but as they, as we reach out, as we reach out and as we all sit here and watch, dark energy continues to reshape the universe of our grandpappies. <laughs> the universe that we know and love. Anyway, Nation, that's right, we've, we've reached across the aisle to the expansionists, uh, but they refuse to meet us halfway. But we believe in being fair and balanced on this program, obviously. And so we want to go to a new segment to talk to Brian Cox, the 14th, a self-described expansionist in our new segment, Better Know a Galactic Representative. Hello there, thanks for having me. Shut up. Ooh, shut that trap. See how easy that is? That's gravity, just works. So it looks like we have runaway expansion happening here with no checks and balances whatsoever. But we both heard the people say, no new space. But the question is, how big can the universe get and where does it stop? Well, first of all, I wouldn't call myself exactly an expansionist. Um, it's really more of just a, a, a more space for all kind of movement. It's a um, occupy space time, if you will. This is a lot of oh, I won't. <laughs> but let me ask you. Thanks, guys. Who's going to win this, gravity or dark energy? I think it's important to say that gravity and dark energy actually work in concert with one another to make the universe what it is. The, uh, with, without the dark energy, if we only had gravity, things would be out of balance. You might even say that dark energy evens the playing field. Oh, 
excuse me, I must have dozed off during something fascinating. But let me ask you, sir, what exactly is this dark energy? Well, other than the fact that it exists and that it's pushing the universe apart, we don't really... Well, it, it might be a vacuum of some sort. Ha! I thought so. Isn't it true that we know nothing about this dark energy? This interview is over, sir. I think we've got enough. That's right, you heard it here first, folks. Cosmic Nightly News exclusive. We know very little about dark energy, except that I didn't like it then, and I still don't like it now. <laughs> but I want to turn a page here, Nation, something more positive, okay? I want to turn back to our foundations, turn back to gravity. That's right, I want to talk about the beauty of gravity. Uh, uh, but hang on there, folks. We're getting some breaking news. It turns out a star is about to explode in the far reaches of the Andromeda galaxy. It looks like we're going to see firsthand how a supernova does what it does. Luckily, we have on hand our senior blowing stuff up correspondent, Kevin Monday. <laughs> Kevin, what can you tell us? Well, Brian, it's really hot right now and getting hotter and brighter. I'd really rather not be here. <laughs> now, Kevin, I've heard that supernova might help us learn more about this dark energy. What can you tell us there? Really? You want to do this now? Because my life is actually in danger. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let's do this. <sighs> okay. Well, supernova are exploding stars that burn as bright as a galaxy, and scientists can track how the and measure their distance from Earth so they can tell how fast the universe is expanding. Turns out that that expansion is speeding up because of dark energy. But I should point out that they explode at the speed of light, and this one's not too far away right now. So, yeah. Well, Kevin, one more question for you. How hot can a supernova get? We're talking about 6,000 times the heat of the sun, Brian. It's pretty uncomfortable. Can't we just be done with this? Well, we'll check back with you for further updates, Kevin. Thanks a lot. Uh Probably not, Brian. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> well, folks, that's all the time we have for tonight. The nation, no matter what side you're on, I just want you to remember that from our little corner of a smidgen of the universe, we've learned so much about it and so much about ourselves. Good night, and keep looking up. Here it is, your moment of cosmos. <laughs> Let's have a one more, uh, round of applause one more time for our five speakers tonight. <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. Okay, so, uh, wow, okay. Um, so now, here's our moment of truth. So, it comes to a point where we now have to judge our five speakers. I know, I know, oh, God, how am I gonna do this? Applied for all of them. Let's just see what happens, okay? <laughs> um, so, what I'm going to do is we're getting ourselves set up. Dave, are we set up? We are set up. Okay, so, five speaker. Oh, yep, yeah, please clear the stage. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, helpers. All right, so please, five speakers, would you please come back out on stage for us all? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to ask, we're going to we, five seconds. Okay, we're going to apply for each one of our five speakers. And then at the end of this, we'll give the one person a prize. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna, oh, that's it. Yeah, good, great, great call. Let's do a practice. Okay, we're going to go for five seconds. Okay, practice. You'll see how this is going to work. I think we're going with max is going to be our ultimate, uh, our ultimate uh, variable here in terms of who wins. So let's try this out. Ready? Let's just imagine it's me. 
So, uh, everyone, please applaud for Christopher Miller. Excellent work, excellent work. 99. I better win this. <laughs> All right. Let's give this a shot. Here we go. So, oh, I'm, uh, I'm going to try this one more time because I messed up because I was. Uh, I'm gonna apply, let's apply for three seconds. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put my hands down so we stop at the right time. Ready? Five. Oh, let's go to three for a second. Just quick. Okay. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Apply. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, we're going to try that again. All right, so here we go. Let's start with our first speaker of the evening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, five seconds. Here we go. Everyone, Dr. Don Lincoln. Excellent. 100.4. Fantastic. Fantastic. Dr. T, are you ready? Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. T. Michelli. Excellent work, 102.1. Our third speaker, is that you, Dr. Hugh? Is that Dr. Hugh, Dr. Hugh? All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Our third speaker of this evening, Dr. Hugh Leppincott. Oh, my Lord, that's awesome. I like to compare this to last year, just because you're so much louder. All right, here we go. Our which one is? Peak is tiebreaker. I don't think we have a tie quite yet, but maybe. All right, our fourth speaker of this evening. Ready, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Chris Polly. <laughs> All right, fantastic. And our fifth speaker of the evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Brian Nord. <laughs> All right, we will quickly tabulate our results. You have the results, sir. Okay, yes, you do or do not. <laughs> you calculate them. Great. All right, well, welcome. Okay, or not welcome. Uh, this is when I fill. So, uh, it's only 9.16. I know, right? Yeah! Let's look at it tonight! I want to learn physics and now I can do other things. That's what happens when you do your homework, right? You can do your homework and then you can do other things. Do your homework first. And you can be a doctor like these people. <laughs> That's going to be the, so. Here's what's going to happen. I am going to be uh, introducing up to the stage, right, the director of our Fermi Lab, uh, Dr. Lo Dr. Nigel Lockyer. He'll be coming up right now. Doctor, please come up. This is when I get intimidated, right? Like, you know those times when you like meet like someone really famous? Excuse me, I'm <laughs> taking over. Sorry, sir. I shall move. On. I shall move here. What are we doing now? I, <laughs> <laughs> what is I don't know, what is sir. This champion. Oh, this is the champion. Okay. All right. Do you remember who got the highest score? This one? This one? <laughs> Boy, you don't know. <laughs> the winner is Dr. Tia. <laughs> and there seems to be a Prize associated with this, <laughs> the physics of superheroes. There you go. Thank you. Here, you've always wanted that. <laughs> All right, a round of applause for Dr. Don.
And the bubble chamber doctor, Dr. Hugh. And Elvis, Dr. Elvis. And Dr. Brian, congratulations. Of course, they're all winners. So now it is time to open the floor up to you. Uh, because ultimately, we had a lot of fun doing Physics Slam. I know the five of them backstage after each one of them got finished, I went to go say congratulations, and they were all smiles uh, because your, uh, your, your appreciation was overwhelming, I'm assuming, to them. I'm speaking for them, but I can only imagine that it was. But uh, ultimately, we're also here. I think the, the six of us were also teachers, and we also want to uh, tell you what things we have learned and what they have learned and what they want to tell us. They want to answer your questions because that's ultimately what we're all here to do is to do research and to learn to teach. So we now want to open the floor to you. So I have uh, two people with uh, microphones. Please hold your microphones in the air, you two. And uh, so I'd like to get a quick hand. I see a hand right there in the center is the first one I saw. We're going to open the floor up for a couple of question and answers. And uh, just ask if you wouldn't mind uh, if you have an answer for the entire panel, please say that in the red uh, right there, Dr. Carter. Um, or if you have an in, uh, individual question for one of our speakers, please call them by their name, and uh, they'll be more than happy to answer your question. So, ma'am, please. Dr. Lincoln, you were talking about the extraordinarily unbelievable high temperatures created in the LHC. And I am curious, and something that's already, already always rattled in my brain about these high temperatures in the um, accelerators, how do you keep the accelerators from melting? That is an excellent question. The thing to keep in mind is even though the temperatures are very high, the actual energies, but uh, two protons colliding together is actually the same energy as two mosquitoes bonking into one another. So, you know, how, this is kind of weird. How can you reconcile these high temperatures and two mosquitoes bonking into one another? The thing is, the energy is concentrated in a very, very small volume, much, much smaller than a proton. And to give you a sense of scale of how hot it is in those conditions, you'd have to take the energy of the sun for a million years, concentrate it into the size of a basketball, and that's what it's like in there. But remember, these are really, really tiny. So it's kind of like the difference between... Um, you know, if you heat up a, a match or something, it's very hot, but it's not that dangerous. And it's mostly just because it's very, very small. Very hot, but very small. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Hand up. And I know there's going to be. Oh, there, right there, sir. Go right ahead. Yes, sir. Oh, oh hi. <laughs> uh, this question is for Dr. Chris uh, uh, Polly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there, can, mu can muons ever be stabilized and used as energy in some s situation? That's an interesting question. Um, you, can't, you can't stabilize them, but there is one of these narrow misses in the history of physics that people worked on for many years, and it's called muon catalyzed fusion. It turns out if you take deuterium and tritium and you put them together, they'll form a molecule. And occasionally, those two nuclei will get close enough as a molecule that they'll overlap and they'll fuse. Now, if instead of binding them with an electron, you bind them with a muon, then suddenly the mass of the muon pulls them together, and it causes that fusion rate to happen more readily. Um, the reason this is interesting is because every gallon of ocean water contains enough deuterium in it that it would equal roughly, you know, 300 gallons of gas or something if you could get it out and use it. But unfortunately, it's one of these narrow myths uh, sort of efforts that we, you know, research is research. It isn't always successful. The problem is the muons aren't able to hop around and catalyze enough fusion uh, to really reach the break-even point. But it was a very interesting area of research for, you know, 20 years. People still work on it and have ideas today. But um, so I guess the answer is, Nobody sees a path for that right now, but it was a very uh, interesting portion in time where people thought it might have been possible. Thanks, Dr. Powell. We have a question right over here. Please, uh, sir. This is a, a question for anyone that can answer it. Um, 
it, it, as I understand it, the general consensus is that space itself was created uh, uh, by the Big Bang and as a result of it. Is it also a consensus that time itself was created then, or, or do people think it, it may have existed in a different form before that? So we, we have no idea actually what was before the Big Bang. Um, we, can't, we can only actually see back to the cosmic wave background, which is a little bit after that. And um, when, you, when you think about space in a bit of a different way, the way that, that knucklehead Einstein did, you, uh, space and time become the same. So the answer is yes, space and time in that situation, that, that is how time was created. But time is not, you know, people are still debating about if time is a real thing or not. And I think that that is somewhat of an open question. So you know, we, the, one, of the, one of the better ways to think about time is increasing entropy or increasing disorder, since, it only, since that only goes really in one direction in our universe. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Question over here. This is for anyone who can answer it. Um, the, how can the weight uh, of the top quark cause an end to the universe? I've, I've read some things about that. Well, this is, um, well, first it's a, what you call a theoretical speculation. I'm an experimentalist, so you know, you gotta prove the theory if it's true. However, um, the, the idea is, is if the Higgs boson mass is what we measure, and the top quark mass is what we measure, then it makes the universe what we call metastable. And so what is metastable? Well, the way to think of it, there you have stable, unstable, and metastable. Stable is like if you put a, a pool cue on a, uh, a table, it d doesn't fall. Um, unstable is when you try to balance it. Metastable is like a bar stool. So it would prefer to fall over, but it'll stay there a very long time. If the, the mass of the Higgs and the mass of the top are what we measure, then the theory suggests that the universe is metastable, which says in billions and billions of years, the universe will change the rules. And at that moment, in a little bubble somewhere in the universe, not here, um, all of the rules will change and things like matter and energy will be different. Atoms won't exist and things like that. I mean, you don't have to worry about that now. You still got to pay your taxes. You still got to weatherproof your house. <laughs> But that's the theory. And, and the problem is, is the calculation is very hard, the measurements are imprecise, and the, the jury's still out. But that's the basic thinking of that. And pay your taxes. <laughs> Sir, over here. This is a question. A question for the WIMP detective. <laughs> or friend of wimps. Uh, what's up or what's down with Lux? Haven't heard much from it so far. Uh, that's a very specific question. Um, Lux is an experiment that has been looking for dark matter. Uh, they turned on a few months ago and they actually did just release some results as of two weeks ago, I believe. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that they saw nothing. So this is very common in dark matter. Um, you know, we're looking for this very, very rare interaction and it's quite possible we're never going to find it, um, which is a little depressing sometimes. Sometimes I think we're about to find it, sometimes we think we're not. Uh, but so Lux improved the best sort of sensitivity. So what people generally do is they look, they make a search, they find out whether they see anything or they don't. In most cases, they don't. And so you can draw a line where you can say dark matter is not here because we would have seen it if it were there. And so now we're looking for a new sort of region of parameter space. So at Lux was an experiment that was taking place in uh, South Dakota. They saw nothing, so their line is now a factor of three or so better than the previous line. So that's a whole new set of models that are being ruled out, but there is still a lot of space to go. So they saw nothing. That's, you know, maybe we were hoping to see signals, uh, but the, the game isn't over yet. Does that answer your question? Excellent. <clears throat> we have time for two more questions, so we would take a question back there. Go ahead, sir. I'd like to know what's next after the Large Hadron Collider. Is it the, the end of all accelerators, or will there be more after it? Oh. <laughs> That's actually a good question for the director to answer. Um, well, that, that question will be answered at a pay grade higher than mine. Um, 
We scientists have several ideas. Fermilab is uh, looking into having sh shooting neutrinos from here to South Dakota. And so even though it's a lower energy accelerator than the Large Hadron Collider, by the vagaries of quantum mechanics, can actually study uh, things that the um, LHC can't even touch. So that's what Fermilab is doing. Fermilab is trying to make really intense beams because that allows us to study things that no other accelerator can. Um, those of us who do energy frontier, of course, would like to have a bigger accelerator. And you know, it sort of seems to me that Fermilab would be an ideal place to host it. Yeah, absolutely. That question depends on you guys, actually. I mean, we are funded by you, effectively, to do what we do. And so if you would like to see the next accelerator built, which I think everybody up here would agree is probably a good goal, write your congressman. And give us money. <laughs> and we'll go find all the stuff that we're trying to understand. <laughs> Great answer. We have time for one more question. We'll go right here with you. How, how did physicists begin the um, theory of the Big Bang? Hmm. <laughs> that was that was over, you know, thousands of years ago. Yes, I can't really remember. <laughs> yeah. um, the theory of the Big Bang was developed, um, you know, I don't know, 80 years ago. I don't remember exactly when it was, and it came from studying what we see when we look out in the cosmos. Because, you know, 100 years ago, people didn't know how the universe really came into existence. There were lots of ideas on that. Um, in fact, people, some people thought the universe always existed. I mean, that was a very common idea. But and it was about, I think, 1929 when Edwin Hubble saw that the universe was expanding. And if the universe is expanding, it's getting bigger. Then that means if you run the clock backwards, it was once smaller. And so it wasn't that this, like, came to him in a dream. He looked at the data and said, you know, the universe must have been smaller. And of course, if it's smaller, something caused it to expand. And in fact, this is a, a, a true thing. Um, we call it the Big Bang, but this was actually an insult. It was on a radio station um, some years ago, you know, back in the 50s or so. Somebody who thought this idea was ridiculous that the universe was expanding said, you know, what is this like, this, this Big Bang idea? Are you crazy? And everyone said, cool idea, we'll take it. <laughs> So, but it was really driven by data. We see the universe is expanding, and that means it had to be smaller. The details of it, we don't understand. That's a lot of tricky business. And uh, in fact, some of the youngsters here in the audience, you go to grad school, learn some stuff, maybe you can answer that for me, because none of us know the answer. Thanks, man. I want to add just one thing because there is a very compelling bit of observational evidence that you um, that we all talk about as well, and it's called it's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. So you know, if you believe in this history of the universe, you ought to in the the explosion and the way the particles coalesce, you ought to be able to look out in the universe and see the remnants of that explosion. And in fact, we do. We look out and we see this perfect black body radiation called the cosmic microwave background. And we even can see how it clumps and what it tells us about the universe form. So astrophysics has become a very numerical field um, where they really have real data that only supports certain models. And so the, the data is quite good, actually. Excellent. Thanks. Excellent. I do have one more question. I saw this young man's hand shoot up right when I said our last question. So I do want to take his question. So doctors, one more question, if you don't mind. This question Please. is for Mrs. Dr. Micelli? Micelli? Um, do the neutrinos <laughs> have any dangers or any uses? Um, so they're not dangerous in any way, but for uses, I mean, they have scientific uses, but right now I don't know of any technology yet that makes use of neutrinos. There's some ideas that it could be used for communications to other planets and lots of crazy things like that but we're not there yet that's something far in the future maybe in 20 30 31 <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah we'll have to wait and see excellent
So that will be it. One more, how do we have applause one more time for our five speakers tonight? Thank you very much. Now, thank you. As I uh, do want to give them a few moments to uh, walk up the stairs, and as I also like to talk, um, uh, are there any questions for me? Anything you'd want to know uh, about a speech teacher? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone at all like to raise your hand up and uh, ask any sort of compelling question <clears throat> that I could? Uh, yes! Go ahead, sir. This shall be most interesting. Could you tell us how much you weigh in electron volts, please? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, including my hair or pre-bald or post-bald. Yeah, I have an actual real question over there, Dr. Carter. But I do think it's like 1.28 electrovolts. <laughs> I have to do the math. It's the V times VN <laughs> over the VT <laughs> divided by VE brings me to 1.24 volts. For the physics limb, how long do they practice and how are they chosen? That's a great question. Um, how they're picked is from a committee. Um, I'm not part of that committee. Um, but uh, I... Uh, I do teach at College of DuPage, and so uh, the beginning of our semester is August, and I'd say roughly uh, beginning of middle of September, I started getting uh, emails from them just about ideas and that sort of thing. And so then I would kind of email them back and say, hey, what do you think? Yeah, this is an idea, this is an idea. Um, but starting, it was, so today's Friday, so last Monday I came in and watched all five of their speeches. And um, they're all about 25 minutes long, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, and I'm not getting paid, okay? <laughs> That's why I take my time up here. <laughs> and I'm not getting paid, Dave. Um, but I, but so I, but I, I come in and I watch their speeches and then I, I just I tell them stuff and I'll, I'll tell you this about the five of them is that they took you know they're all they're doctors you know physics and I'm I'm a speech and I'm not trying to be you know because speech is awesome okay? um, but I'm a speech teacher from COD and I I can't thank them enough because I give them a note I tell them some stuff and they put the jokes in there you know Dr Tia when she first did her speech uh, when she won tonight you know but she first did it and she was reading and um, Extremely, I'm sorry, Dr. T, if you hear me, don't be mad at me. I'll run by her. I'm faster than she is, I'm sure. Um, but she was, and she was incredibly nervous. She was extremely nervous and wasn't sure what to do. And she had these ideas. And I said, hey, take some files and make them into files and play the whole detective thing up and da 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 da. And even two days ago, she had the whole idea of the neutrino thing with the sound effects. And she actually had, what does the fox say as her sound effect? And I said, you know, that's not going to work because Brian's doing that in his. And it's not that you shouldn't do it because Brian's doing it because, you know, whatever. But I was like, this doesn't fit. So find another song. And I thought she should do something by Chicago or whatever, some kind of song that we all could relate to. And two days ago, she was like, oh, I'm going to be wearing red. What do you think about Lady in Red? I'm like, yes, play Lady in Red. And, uh, and she's like, okay, I got it. And it's, it, it's so cute to watch them grow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my babies are growing up. Um, because all five of them just took notes and they did stuff and, it, and, and, they, and they used it. And uh, that's the thing about public address, public speaking, is that these are five, and you heard them talk. I mean, when you, do, when you ask the question and answer, that's when I just stand to the side and go, duh, I don't know. But because they're so smart, but anybody is so afraid. They're all they were. They're so were so afraid to speak, you know. And they were so every time I can't I cannot tell you enough that when I went backstage and I was like, hey, nice job. They were like, thank you. And they're so appreciative of your applause, so appreciative of your laughter, so appreciative that they were able to do it. And that's that's what ultimately makes it for you is that you know you did it over there, Tom Carter. <laughs> <laughs> that little man over that little person over there, I don't know who you are, but if you want to come ask me a question when we're done, please come and see me. Oh, you want to just yell it to me? Yeah, yeah go ahead.
There's somebody in particular on the committee that just had a wonderful idea to do a physics slam, and we did it last year for the first. Oh, right there, please stand. No, we have a question. Oh gosh, okay. No, actually. Somebody this, thought of the physics this, slam, it wasn't me. This question, I'm sorry, Chris, yeah. is not oh. for you. Okay. It's for um, Dr. Tom Carter. Can you please? We've heard a lot about College of DuPage. Is is do they have a good physics program? <laughs> No, we o we only teach speech. It's the whole college. Right. <laughs> whole, whole college. No, can, no can, you tell us, can you tell us? Can you tell us? Do some of our students possibly have internships at Fermi Lab? Is that a good? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is okay, that we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Carter does not like talking about himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you one last time for coming out to the second annual college thing. <laughs> <laughs> And the speakers will be in the lobby. Feel free to go ask them questions outside. Thanks so very much, everybody.